I'm Brodor, and this is Why We Game. Today, my guest is Dave Wallace. Now, if you've ever read The Hobbit, and I suspect that you have, Dave Wallace is basically the smog of retail. He is the legend, the thing that is in the mountain that no one has forgotten, but whispers of its existence are on the horizon, and other retails everywhere hope to someday develop as much sort of as much of a, a horde of influence as Dave has over the years. I like that go with that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, it's what I did do. Uh, I did. Uh, I did to Lusinski too. I went into the whole thing about how you know the, the titan of miniature market. But any which way, actually, no, it's true though, Dave. You've been doing this since 1981. 81. You are a retailer in St. Louis, Missouri. Yep. You've literally written the book on retailing in the specialty hobby industry. Yeah. Kelly and I wrote uh, several books. The specialty retailer's handbook is still. Finally, well, well regarded. We still sell copies today, 20 years later. If you are Moses, then Kelly is your burning bush. Oh, yeah. Uh, she's the one that makes me look like I can actually string words together and I'm intelligent. She also, she's uh, the Dave Whisperer. She <laughs> has an ability to not only convey what you mean, but to translate others into Dave's. Yes. It's pretty interesting. Let's uh, let's get a couple things out of the way first. Full disclosure, I've known Dave since I was in the single digits. My older brother, who is my personal hero and my strongest father figure besides my real father, uh, Dave is somebody who I also consider a father-like figure. There is a lot about this industry and about the hobby that I just would have never known without my exposure with Dave. Now, the other thing is, is that Dave and I had a pretty bitter falling out back in August of 2015. I know there are people who I would consider close friends and loved ones who are going to be mad at me for not, you know, doing this as a hit piece and attacking you. Uh, so I mean, we can get into to that stuff later, but any anger or hurt feelings that I would have have, even if they were fresh, I would have to have the wisdom to set them aside and sit down and talk to you because you are a wealth of information in the history of this industry that's fascinating to me. And frankly, it wouldn't be where it's at if it weren't for you and your ilk. I thank you for that. And the reality, again, even though we did have a falling out, no hard feelings, and I think that we can both work through everything. And, yeah, there are misunderstandings. There are uh, some harsh feelings involved, but not on my part. Everything's forgiven. Everything's forgotten. And uh, I welcome you. To be fair to you, the Fantasy Shop and the Dave Wallace game, there's been, uh, over the years, there's been all sorts of, you know, scuttlebutt and suspicion and conspiracy about, uh, you know, why this employee left or why this employee got fired and is the Fantasy Shop going out of business? I mean, hell, I worked here for 13 plus years and, I mean, we were going out of business every six months. I mean, it was yeah. crazy. It, it, it's been that way. Since the very beginning. Yeah. 39 it's, years now. Yeah. It's because it would make me so mad. I, people would talk about how, you know, oh, the fantasy shop's not doing well because of X, Y, and Z. And I would just think, I was like, you motherfuckers. I, <laughs> I, I'm i running this company. It's the first time in our history that all four of our current St. Louis shops have been all profitable at the same time. And now you're shitting on me, not knowing what you're talking about. But – you know, I'm. But, but that's it. They don't know what they're talking. Yeah, about. well, I'm guilty as charged too. I talk a lot of shit about things that I don't know what I'm talking about. One of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast because I should talk shit about things that I actually understand. It, it certainly is more productive. So yeah, I would welcome that. No, I, everybody is entitled to an opinion, and let's face it, we generally tend to root for the underdog, since we've been the longest and the longest established. Uh, yeah, people look for us to fail. But the reality is that uh, we're evolving. We're constantly evolving. And that means doing things differently. That means disappointing some people. That means finding uh, new ways to do business. Um, we can't please all the people all the time. So we, d we just don't let it bother us that much. Let's go back then to when the fantasy shop, before there was any recognizable evolution, when you crawled from the primordial soup back in 1981. How did you start that first shop? Badly. <laughs> um, 
I didn't know what I wanted to do. There's a grammar knots out there going poorly, Dave, poorly. poorly. My, my father had just retired, didn't know what to, he wanted to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I still don't know what I want to do. I figure after 39 years, I'm going to have to face the facts and call this a career. But we didn't know what we wanted to do. So he humored me and we got the shop open. But as I tell people, I'm probably the worst retailer you've ever met because I've made every mistake that can possibly be made. If you can screw it up, I did that. But we tend to learn from our mistakes. And we got better and better as we went along, which is why we're still here 39 years later. But no, it was it was just a labor of love at the time. Back in that time when you were doing it, not only was there no internet, but there were almost no stores like the Fantasy Shop out there. Right. If you wanted to buy a Dungeons and Dragons, a player's handbook, there were probably five places in St. Louis where you could actually find that. And like you said, there was no internet. You couldn't go online and buy it. So at that time, it was a relatively easier business and then you simply had to have what people were looking for. Now, there weren't all that many people looking for it, but there were enough to allow us to get by. But again, as I said, over the years, the one thing we've done is evolved and changed. There is an Internet now and there are, you know, I can buy that stuff at uh, 30, 40, 50 stores right now, no problem whatsoever. So how we do business has had to change and evolve during that time period. You know what? Let's let's just get right into that subject, the subject of sales being the next evolutionary step. When you and I were speaking before we started recording about some internet game stores, uh, miniature market, collector store, et cetera, that are doing well in these times because they're the most reliable outlet in terms of getting your hands on that product and having product delivered. I mean, hell, Amazon's having difficulty getting gaming product from what I hear. Go back pre-pandemic, you know, let's drop back 5, 10, 15 years ago. The thing is that uh, when it comes to marketing, when it comes to running a business, we don't all want the same things. So some customers shop based strictly on a, I'm looking for the best price I can get. And that certainly affected the music industry very heavily. But in most cases, uh, you know, when I say let's go out and have some Chinese or eat some Mexican, there's not one Mexican store. There's not one uh, Chinese restaurant. We all have different things that we like and that we want. There are customers that the Internet is the answer to everything. It's got everything they want at the lowest possible price and they never have to leave home. But there are just as many people out there that, no, I like going to the restaurant and I enjoy the atmosphere and I want to have something different. Uh, I don't want you to do me the favor of only giving me one choice in my life. So even before the pandemic, yes, there are customers that want the Internet and they're not my customers. I mean, I, I don't mean that in a bad or negative sense. They just simply aren't shopping with me. They don't see value in the store. That's okay. I, I don't have to be everything for everyone. So the people that come into my shop still want me to match prices with the Internet, but I don't do business like the Internet. I'm in a competitive market where I have to have a good location. I'm paying for my landlord. I'm paying for my rent. I'm paying my utilities. My labor costs are different from them. They can do something that I cannot do, but I can do things that they cannot do. Right now, with the pandemic, you add in the I'm afraid to leave home or people don't want me to leave home. I'm getting used to doing business on the Internet. It's no surprise that they're having their best business ever. What will happen post-pandemic? I, I don't know. Obviously, I think most of that's going to stay with them. Yeah, that's the that's the rub, isn't it? Because I think that when we get on the other side of this thing, People have developed new habits with whom they purchase. They've gotten used to not participating in organized play. They've gotten used to doing FNM online via Arena. They've gotten used to doing Roll20 or whatever online platform you're doing for your role-playing games. I mean, miniature gamers are the guys who are really fucked out of this whole thing yeah. because they can't get together and do tournaments and things. I mean, we can play privately, but I want to go to the game store because the game store has a big table and terrain and... And well, we had, we had already begun to switch over before the virus showed up. 
we recognize that to a large degree our customer if, base – If I can interrupt you, Dave. When you say switching over, you mean switching over from being in event-oriented space? Focusing on events. OK. So you still have event space, but it's yes. not as substantial as it was. Well, we recognize that – I said to my employees, think about the store as a school, all right? The incoming freshman class – wants to come in and pay tuition to us because they want to come to school. They want to learn about comic books. They want to learn about card games and role-playing games and board games. Now, they can go online, but they don't know what they're looking for. They don't know which is the best product. They don't know what the award winners are. They don't have anybody to talk it over with. Now, some of them do go online. They're they're happy with that. And post-pandemic, I'm sure that's going to continue. But a lot of them know the whole reason that they want to come to the store is because not only do we have the product, but we have the knowledge and the opportunity to discuss it, to share it. You know, I can watch baseball on television, but do I want to go down to the Bush Stadium and watch the cards play? There's a big difference between the two. So we recognize that the people who have already graduated, our alumni, they still love the store. They still like us. They still want to shop but they don't want to shop with us because they don't need us any longer. They've gotten the lessons. They know what they want, and a lot of them are going to go online. Well, I can't stop that, and I wouldn't want to. But that new incoming freshman class, that's different. Those are the people that they still need us. They still want us, and they don't mind paying tuition. So we had already begun to shift our focus away from the event and the alumni Back to that incoming class that, you know, I went and saw a Batman movie and I want to read more, but I don't know what to read. I don't know what to pick up. Uh, what would you guys recommend? I heard about magic, but I don't really know how to play it. I want somebody to walk me through it and give me an opportunity to play with other people. So we're not here for everyone. We can't be here for everyone. So will the Internet businesses put us to shame in the future? I'm sure they will. But that doesn't mean that we'll go away, and that doesn't mean that we won't have customers that don't see value in what we're offering. Do you have any interest in pursuing hybridizing your business model to include online sales? We do, and we've talked about it, but it really is two different forms of business. Uh, The skills and the knowledge required are different in each case. So, yes, we could. Um, And I, I might at some point in the future look for somebody that's already in internet look to acquire and uh, merge with them but right now we have enough trouble just trying to take care of the incoming freshman class so trying to load another business on top of what we already do i don't think that's really the right answer for us prior to covid having pared back your event space did you see an impact on your sales, uh, positively or negatively, from not doing events to the degree that you were? Absolutely. The, the thing is that anytime you're going to make a change, you're going to disappoint someone. And when you make a change, it's not going to go well at first because it's the first time you've done that thing. So, yeah, we got a lot of bad feedback. We got people that were angry at us. But we also had wonderful reviews from people that loved the store and what we were doing. So we did see a drop in sales from it, Uh, not drastically, but we did see a drop. But I think that in the long run, it's still the right move for us. As I said, if we stay the same, if we don't change anything, then we're on our way out. Even prior prior to COVID, you and I had uh, a a pretty long discussion about promo space and the value of promo space. Frankly, we disagreed, but I have to concede that the redesigns that you've made for this location here in St. Charles, it looks really good. The store looks nice. It does. The the employees really embraced it or using the opportunity, trying to do things differently. And again, we, we haven't mastered it. We still have a long way to go before we can even claim to be experts at it. But they haven't sat on their hands. I mean, the key thing, whether it's the events, the ordering, anything else, comes back to we're not victims here. We're not going to sit back and wait for things to overtake us. We're going to look for ways to positively impact it moving forward. And they've done a wonderful job with that. Since the cancellation of Gen Con and essentially most of convention season that we're aware of, I have two avenues that I want to explore. One, how do you think that's going to impact your business not having Gen Con this year? 
I honestly don't think it is going to impact us heavily. There's a major difference here between the comic industry and the gaming industry. You have to remember in the comic industry, we're primarily looking at Marvel and DC. These are billion-dollar corporations owned by even bigger billion-dollar conglomerates. But when you look at the gaming industry, with the exception of Asmodee and WotC, most of the manufacturers are three guys working out of a house. The ability to be able to produce product is much, much more difficult on the gaming side of things. And when the gaming manu- or distributors basically shut down, most of the manufacturers look, even if we have the game, we're ready to go, we're ready to produce it. It's not going to do us any good to have 10,000 copies sitting in our garage and nobody out there to sell it for us. So I think you've had this strange system where the game and the distributors and the game manufacturers are basically looking at each other, waiting for the other one to go first. So we're happy to open up the warehouse and ship your product, but you're not giving us any product. Well, we'd be happy to give you the product, but we can't do that. We can't afford to get it produced until we know you're going to ship it. So we're both waiting for the other one to pull the trigger. The two large conglomerates, Asmodee and Watsi, ironically, are just the opposite. The decisions there are being made by the conglomerate, not by the gamer. And they've both basically announced that, no, we're going to flood the system. Asmodee, we're going to produce 40 new products in the month of June. So more than one product a day coming out. And Watsi is going to produce... They've got seven major releases coming out in eight weeks, plus like 20 more smaller releases that they're doing at the same time. So you can see the difference between a gamer's approach to gaming here and a conglomerate businessman's approach to gaming here. Well, let's let's talk about Watsi because you had alluded to something that you want to discuss about Watsi. Let's just dive right into the situation with Watsi specifically flooding the market with product. Why do you think that that is? I'm very cautious to say this because I can't say it in any way that's not going to come out badly. So I have to ask your listeners to follow along with me. There are some people out there that are benefiting from the virus. Now, I don't mean in a negative way. I'm not suggesting they're dancing on graves or they're happy with this see it going on. But let's face it, there are some businesses that are simply better off because of what's happening with the virus. Just any Internet business is obviously having some of their best days ever, simply because people are staying at home. They don't want to go to the stores. The stores are shut down. There's not much new coming out. So they're using the Internet more. That's perfectly fine. They're benefiting from that. But there are also companies out there that I think see potential benefit. And I, I, I'm not a conspiracy nut. But the fact of the matter is that I think that this did predate the virus to some degree. Watsi is basically saying not only are we going to bring a lot of product out, but we're going to cancel events and encourage everyone to play online. All of a sudden, they've gotten very generous with, uh, we'll give you codes for everything going online. We're going to give you extra product free of charge if you drive your people online. We're going to support you if you're doing, hey, stay at home and do it all online. I have to believe that Watsi has decided that uh, they'd rather be a internet business. They'd rather do a virtual game than do a live game. It just has benefits for them, and and it does. I, I don't deny that in any way whatsoever. Yeah, well, I mean, to, to plug my website, I mean, fuck, it's my show, right? On uh, GoInfo.org and the Influence Foundation website, I actually have an article posted about domestic manufacturing. That's one of the, the interesting topics that you can get into is that is the future of gaming – digital and utterly non-physical. I think it is an increasingly viable model to do digital gaming exclusively. Uh, Absolutely. No question about it. But again, that doesn't mean that uh, the hard experience is going away. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have board games, card games, miniatures, or anything else. Uh, It just means that a new area has opened up that some people are going to take advantage of. I I read an article today that said that uh, they're releasing out of these almost 30 products. One of them is a a set of cards specifically aimed at the whale. That was their term, not mine. So just like Vegas, no, they recognize that there are people out there that, would you pay $400 for this? You would. (laughs) Well, then we should produce it. So... (laughs) The fact that it may not benefit the store or we're not even going to let the store have it 
doesn't change the fact that they see the value in it. But there was a time, though, where the game company could not exist without the brick and mortar game store. And for those out there who are not in the know, and I don't pretend to be an expert, but essentially there is a three tier distribution system. The company that published the game that had the game manufactured and shipped to the States is going to sell that game to a distributor. That distributor is going to market up a very small percentage and they're going to sell it to the brick and mortar retailer who's then going to market up usually about 50%, sometimes less and sell that to you directly. And there was a time where we all needed each other. I needed the distributor to work with the publisher to get the product. But now, do I need the distributor? There's a lot of product I can get directly from publishers. Shit, does Asmodee need Dave Wallace? Does Asmodee need the fantasy shop in the future if they can market and ship directly to the consumer? Probably not. However, let's take a look at the state of Kickstarter right now. You probably are aware if you talk to the Small Business Administration that most small businesses are going to fail. Back when I hit my 10-year anniversary, the numbers they provided me with said more than 98% of small businesses never made it to their 10th year anniversary. Now, the reason most of us don't make it that far is because not a lack of industry knowledge. I mean, if you're a gamer, you probably know games. You can probably sell games. The, what's going to kill you is lack of business knowledge. Uh, you may know games perfectly, but what do you know about reading and negotiating a triple net commercial lease? Well, I don't. That's why um, I have to buy your book. I, absolutely. But also plate glass insurance. What are your legal forms of opening up a business? Uh, what are the tax benefits of one versus the other? When does workman's comp kick in? Those are the things that generally kill off most small businesses. It's the lack of business knowledge. Well, when you look at Kickstarter... What we've done is we've just taken the manufacturer, the distributor, and the retailer, rolled them all into one, and said, sure, you can do this. You don't need any <laughs> skills or knowledge. Just go ahead. You don't You don't need to have experience as a game designer. You don't have to have a pedigree. We'll just throw shit up on the internet, and someone will give you money for it. That's how I'm hoping to make my fortune, Dave, <laughs> it is putting stuff on the internet, and people give me money for it. And you know, it's so seductive. I mean, uh, how much more can you get? I don't have to go to school. I don't have to spend 30 years learning this. I can simply put something together and people will give me money and I will be an overnight success and I will be rolling into cash. The problem is that, uh, but there's so much you don't know. I mean, most Kickstarters don't come off. And when they do come off, usually they find they lost money in the transaction. You see very few companies going back again and again to Kickstarter because it's not the you know, wonderful answer that they were trying to make it look to be. You're basically, in this case, I hate to say it, dancing on dead people's graves because most of those Kickstarter people aren't going to be there in the future. You just benefited from them while they were dying. And this is true, again, not just with Kickstarter. In our industry, the comic industry, uh, Marvel Comics tried to buy Heroes World back in the 90s and do their own distribution, screwed it up entirely, totally changed the comic industry because they simply didn't give enough credit to what a distributor did. They didn't understand what they were getting themselves into. So again, I think we're looking at, yes, it will be a new form of gaming taking place that will become probably the 800-pound gorilla in the room, but they won't be the only form. There'll still be stores. There'll still be those freshman classes that are looking for help, looking for aid. They want the retail stores. So, yeah, I can go home and uh, cook Chinese food for myself, but I want to go out to the restaurant. I need an expert to add the MSG. I need someone who knows what they're doing to give me that flavor that I don't understand. Well, and especially I, I just enjoy it. I mean, that's part of what life is for. I not want to doing be able, the dishes? Uh, not only not doing the dishes, but having, you know, somebody come over and wait on me and enjoying the atmosphere, going out with my friends, my, my wife. I don't think that the retail store will go away, but it will change. Uh, it's important to remember that most successful businesses, and I'm not talking comic or game, most successful businesses are usually struggling to make a 4 to 6% profit margin. That's it. That's how free enterprise works. We keep driving the price down to the point where you've got to do really well. You've got to be very efficient. And if you get everything right, 
congratulations, you made that 4 or 5% profit margin. So it's not just us. When I look around the mall that I'm in, almost every business here is doing that same thing. And it doesn't require a 50% drop in your sales to put you in trouble. Yeah, and Dave, you, when you say mall, you mean strip mall, not inside an actual proper mall. Which are doing even worse. Right. Well, which you wouldn't want to sign a lease there as a game store anyway, but that's no. a, that's a, re- buy Dave's book. But the, the reality is that in most cases, since we struggle to make that four or five percent business or profit, and it's based on existing sales, losing 10% of your business can be catastrophic. That's what most of the businesses out there, not just comic and gaming, that's what most of the businesses out there are facing right now. Does your old business model still function, even if you only lose 10, 15% of your business? And it's certainly reasonable to assume, even after the pandemic has run its course, that 10 to 15% of your business probably is now shopping online or still isn't comfortable coming in or just got used to not having it, not dealing with it anymore. That's the big unknown. And I think the thing that is most interesting to me is once the dust settles, how much attrition has the industry suffered? I mean, I spoke to somebody the other day who works for a small game company, said that for their board games, Maybe 30% of their annual sales come from the four days of Gen Con. I know of retailers out there that conventions are what they do. They don't necessarily have a brick and mortar store. They just do resale at cons. Not having a convention season is going to close those types of business models down entirely. And it goes beyond that. Right. We were talking earlier that, look, Marvel and DC are multi-billion dollar conglomerates, but most game manufacturers, with the exception of WotC and Asmodee, are very, very small. They, they don't have the resources. They don't have the money. But the thing about Gen Con is not just the sales that take place there. That's the target date that most of the manufacturers are looking for to release the new product. Because that's, as you said, the opportunity for them to make a bulk of their initial sales. They can afford to take that risk. Right. Without the convention season, when are you going to release that product since you're not going to get that initial cash flow coming in? And that's probably what's going to make it very, very confusing this year. And instead of me taking my new product to Gen Con, my $100 board game, and selling it to you at $80 for a huge discount, and aren't we both so happy? Because you got it at $80 as opposed to 100 bucks, and I sold it to you for 80 bucks as opposed to selling it to the distributor for... 20 25 Yeah, that's pretty fucking cool. Uh, but that's going to... I mean, really put the small manufacturers into serious trouble. Not being able to get the game distributed, but even if you can get it distributed, not getting that immediate cash flow coming in the door, and not being able to tie it to a date. I mean, may as well just roll the dice, all right? Roll a 30-sided dice. That'll be the date we release it, and we'll roll a four-sided. That's how many months in the future. They don't have anything they can rely on at this point. And and something that I'm a firm believer in is the sales force for the hobby industry until the advent of the Internet was the brick-and-mortar retail store. You're the people that sell the product. But the great thing about convention circuit, and particularly the consumer mecca that is Gen Con, not only are you coming to me to see the new hotness, but I get to conscript you or get your assistance in the hype machine for the new product. So even if people aren't buying the hotness from me at the show, you're going back to your hometown, your spheres of influence, you're you're proselytizing the new hotness. That sales opportunity, I think, is going to be really, really missed. Yeah, it's not just the cash. You're right. The people that attend the convention are your marketing force. They are the ones that are going back to their cities and saying, I saw this, this was great, I got it first before anybody else could get it, and now that's not going to happen. It's a lose-lose-lose for most of the game manufacturers. It's going to put them in a very difficult position, and it's going to put the stores in a difficult position because they counted, not on convention sales necessarily, but they counted on those people coming back and generating excitement and giving the store a better idea what to order and what to risk on the new product. It's going to be a desert. It's going to be a time period when I heard about this game, but I don't really know much, and I don't know if it's any good, and I don't know if you're going to carry it. But 
Yeah, um, my hopes are high. (laughs) How well have you fared with your business and your business model during these times? Because I'm I'm in your shops fairly regularly, particularly here and then sometimes the Creve Core location. You've been pretty much operating this whole time? We never officially shut down. And honestly, there was no need. Uh, If you're looking for social distancing right now, trust me, a game store is as good as you're going to do. Usually we're only talking, you know, one, two, three people in the store at a yeah. time. I mean, I don't, I don't say this to be shitty, but just in general, most of the time I come into one of the shops, I'm the only person there that's not an employee. Right. So we, we never felt guilty. We never felt like we were being irresponsible because we were still providing a product that people wanted and needed, especially since they couldn't get out of the house. But we were also doing it in a very good manner. We weren't uh, asking anybody to take any chances they shouldn't. But the bigger problem was the lack of new product. When Diamond Comics distributors said they're not going to ship and when the game distributors, almost more than half of them just shut down. I mean, we're not shipping any product whatsoever. And the manufacturers could not produce product because they didn't have anybody to distribute the product for them. There just wasn't much coming out. I mean, there literally was no reason to come into the store if you'd been in last week because we didn't get much new to show. So for that five, six, seven weeks, yeah, we were down 30 or uh, 70 percent. We were only doing about 30 percent of our normal business. How do you keep your doors open that way? The first thing we did was we closed our hours down. Uh, we went to an eight-hour shift seven days a week so one person could work the store. By keeping our labor cost as low as possible, as long as we were able to pay for the labor and the stuff going out the door, that was our only concern. And we were able to do that. Could I pay the landlords? No. Could I pay off my back debt? No. Could I pay off uh, some of the distributors I owed money to? No, that I had terms with. And they all understood because they were all in the same boat. So most of the landlords are working with us. Now, when I stress working with us, understand that means that you still owe us every bit of the money and we still want to collect every bit of the money, but we'll give you a little more time. We'll let you spread your payments out, but you still owe everything. I don't care if the window of opportunity closed or not. You still owe us the cash. The distributors that we're still working with, yeah, we were able to keep up with them. We were able to pay them as we were going along. We had enough to keep the utilities paid, but I fell behind on a number of my accounts, and I'm still going to be struggling to catch up on those. The bigger concern, again, though, comes back to not how am I going to get through the last month or two or the next month or two. It's what's going to happen after that. Will my business model still function, or will I have to change my business model again to deal with the new reality of how things are going? So the pipelines have only just started opening up last week for the first time. We're seeing promising signs. Sales are certainly better than they were. After complaining, I mean, the last time you and I talked, I had not received any assistance from the government in any form whatsoever. I did. To my great surprise, in the last two weeks, I actually did receive some assistance. Without filing for anything? Oh, no, we filed months ago. Uh, They just finally got back to us. I was quite honestly shocked to hear anything from them. I even got my stimulus check this week, which... I hadn't seen anything of. So we have enough resources to get us through this critical period. But again, that won't matter if I can't run the business post-pandemic. And of course, nobody knows what's going to happen in the next few months. Are we going to see a spike? What's going to happen in the area of a vaccine or anything else? I, I feel optimistic right now that we can still pull this all off. We can still make it work. We can still have a successful business model. But if you were coming to me saying, hey, I want to invest, I would probably caution you, why don't you wait a little while? (laughs) Uh, Not the best time to be doing that. You had uh, you'd mentioned too, Dave, that there was something about Diamond that you wanted to bring up. Uh, Marvel and DC said that they wanted to keep producing comics. They both set out separate messages saying uh, we're going to give more returnability. We're going to give larger discounts. We're going to keep printing But they weren't talking to each other and they weren't talking to the distributors. So with comics, there's basically just the one. Yes. Diamond Comics has basically got a monopoly. They are the sole real comic distributor out there. But they weren't talking to Diamond Comics. So Diamond Comics basically returned that in true form. They didn't talk to the publishers either. They simply announced, oh, and this is the last shipment that's going out. We're not going to ship anymore after this. 
which was completely 100% not what the publishers were saying. They were assuring us that they were going to keep shipping, they were going to keep the product flowing, and their sole distributor turned around and said, well, not through us. So now both the publishers had to figure out what they were going to do and how they were going to come back and approach it, and they didn't bother to talk to Diamond. So at one point, DC Comics announced that everything that was ordered through Diamond is now canceled. They don't have any orders whatsoever. And we're going to go with two brand new distributors, and that's where you should get your book starting this next week. But they didn't talk to Diamond about it. <laughs> and Diamond, Diamond came back and said, uh, no, nothing's canceled. We still have all the numbers. We're just not shipping right now, but it's all still good to go. And DC came back and said, no, no, it isn't. You don't have any numbers, and you don't have the product. It's all been canceled. And Diamond came back and said, no, it's still in our system. We're still willing to honor those numbers. And it turned out the two new distributors that DC was trying to use weren't distributors. They're actually the two largest online deep discounting comic services in the country. And the suggestion was made that they were simply trying to subsidize them and keep them afloat. And you can imagine how please comic shops with the idea that I should go to my closest competitor, the guy that's undercutting me and now getting a better deal than I'm getting and give them all my information. No. The mining of sales data there, that's the bitch of the bunch because that information has tremendous value in terms of doing marketing. I mean, if I'm company X and I'm selling comic books out of New York and I know what the major comic book retailers in the St. Louis area are doing in terms of what they're selling, where they're selling, et cetera, oh, that's, I mean, that's really valuable data. Well, and the worst part is DC acted like that wasn't the case. No, these are distributors. Never mind that they deep discount and that's what they actually do for a living. They just didn't talk about it. It was like they hoped nobody would notice. Now, eventually they started talking to each other and Diamond did announce that, okay, we are going to start shipping again. And yes, we agreed to cancel your orders, but we still have that information. If you just want to hit that button, it'll give you your old information back. But you can modify and change your numbers going forward at this point. So this is the second week that we actually did get new comics in. A trickle compared to what we were getting before, but it is working again. The, the system is up and functioning, and hopefully will continue. Again, we don't know what the pandemic's going to do. But the game distributors followed suit. Basically, there was nothing coming out during that six-week period. Very, very few new products. Now, they've all said, okay, we're shipping again. So Alliance has announced that they are going to ship to me this week. Games Workshop, I've actually gotten two shipments from this week. But again, they are, they're not manufacturers. They're waiting for the other manufacturers to give them something to ship. And since those other manufacturers are not ready to do so at this point, technically the pipeline's open, but realistically there's still not a lot new coming through. So it's very hard to judge what sales you're doing. Is that because people are desperate and want to buy anything they can lay their hands on and are happy to get out of the house? Or, no, you're down because they're still waiting for that new stuff that never shipped. It's a real unknown, a real hard one to put your finger on. Well, if I could jump back in the TARDIS again, what was the thing that got you? What was your poison, right? What was your drug of choice? The game that's, that you said, you know what, I want to be part of this professionally. I, I don't know that I would put it on any specific thing, but going back to the early 80s, Dungeons & Dragons... I mean, uh, it was the 800-pound gorilla at the time. It was the one that was changing us from historical gaming to other forms of gaming. And I certainly was very involved with it, enjoyed it, had a great time with it. And I have for decades. It's always been a favorite of mine. But things really have changed in the last 40 years. The gaming coming out, I mean, going back 30 years ago, most of them were slight improvements on something else. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I heard, well, this is just like Dungeons & Dragons, but only better. No, it's Dungeons & Dragons. I'm sorry. I mean, you got a few twists in there, but it's the same game. You look in the last five, ten years especially, that's changed. Games really are evolving rapidly right now. The quality of the game is so much better than it used to be. Uh, they're trying things they've never done before. They're not just like something else. They're standalone, brand new versions of stuff that you've never seen before. 
And for the young gamer, they don't know that. They don't realize that this is breaking the mold. But it is. This, this is really so much better stuff coming out now. I cannot think of a better time to have been a gamer. It's crazy. There's so much choice. There's so much option. And there's really just so many good hits out there. What's the future for the fantasy shop then? What kind of evolutionary steps are you planning on taking next? Well, my first choice would be you or somebody else comes along and buys them. <laughs> well, Dave, if this works out for me, that ship has sailed. I want to, I, I am truly a brodeur and I love the sound of my own voice and I want to do this forever. Oh, well, my wife and I are getting old enough that, uh, I mean, we'd happily retire tomorrow, but this is an industry where nobody has capital. I mean, the only capital that exists right now is like WotC, uh, Asmodee, equity markets own them. And they're looking for ways to expand, looking for ways to... Now, for those ignorant on economics, what do you mean by it's owned by an equity market? There are equity firms out there that have money they're looking to spend. And just like angel capitalists, they want to buy into an industry, pump some additional money in and remarket what they bought to somebody else to come by and give them even more money for. So when you look at Asmodee, Fantasy Flight, they were originally purchased by a small equity firm who pumped additional money in. They bought up a lot of other accounts. They became a major player, and they sold it to a different equity firm who brought in, and I want to say the last price I saw was like a billion and a half dollars for the company, which is way out of line for what they actually own and what they actually can do. Uh, Watsy's the same way. They've been bought by a number of different equity firms. Uh, it's not owned by Watsy. It's not even owned by Hasbro. It's owned by somebody above them. Uh, I want to say AT&T is running uh, Asmodee right now. I, I, don't hold me to that. But the, the equity firms generally come in at the top. Um, they haven't come in at the retail end. They buy the company. They try to improve the value of the company, all with the idea of remarketing it later to someone else. And usually they'll end up going into vertical integration, which is if I was a manufacturer, now I'm going to buy a distributor. Well, which is interestingly enough, and now you're not a conspiracy theorist. I am to some degree. I still have a sneaking suspicion that Asmo Day is going to purchase ACD. It, it is quite possible. But remember, even without ACD, Asmo Day is doing their own distribution now. The distinction being is that there are a lot of small accounts that – Asmo Day would certainly benefit by being in business with ACD to manage those smaller brick and mortar FLGSs. But now we go back to similar to Marvel and Heroes World. Right this minute, ACD is an independent distributor that anybody can sell to, assuming they can get ACD to agree to buy from them. What manufacturer is going to want to make their product available directly through their competitor, Asmo Day? So who would sell to ACD if it was owned by Asmodee? Ah, see, here's here's the rub. Asmodee doesn't give a shit because they've got enough of the market share already. They don't need to deal with, with your game. What they can do is that they can fold in their distribution and then they can worry about acquisition. It's not your game anymore. I'm going to buy it from you and I'm going to go ahead and distribute it. And if anybody wants that game, they got to get it from me. And I agree with you. And again, keep in mind, they're not doing this because it's the best business model. No, they're putting a price tag on it. Uh, if they go that route, uh, it's because they're going to stick another billion dollars on and try to sell the company to somebody else. Uh, in its own way, it's almost a pyramid scheme. The last one holding the bag is the one that didn't get paid, didn't get the money. But what you don't see is equity firms entering into the retail end of things which really doesn't make a lot of sense. They should be. There are no major chains in our industry. Even 40 years later, we don't have, you know, somebody with 300 stores out there. Uh, most of the time, the largest operations are only averaging uh, three to eight shops. Uh, there are only a couple that are, have a few more than that. So it would be relatively easy to come in if you were an equity firm, buy up a larger retailer and then bring more money in and buy up the additional retailers. An equity firm could step in and have 200 stores by the end of the year if they wanted to. And that puts them in a position to now turn around to Disney and say, hey, we are willing to order from you, but guess what? We're the largest out there. We carry a lot of weight. you got to do things our way. We want exclusives. And that would add value to them and allow them to turn around and put a bigger price tag on it. 
So I suspect at some point that's going to happen. You're going to see an equity firm step in and try to make a run on the retail businesses. That sounds to me like the kind of retail store that I'll have to go to in hell. Once, uh, you know, once Sally Field has read to me all of the books that I never read in high school because I didn't want to, I will have to go to a game store that is like a Walmart where there are fewer employees that they need to be and there's even less product knowledge than there should be. It's to be like walking into fucking Home Depot and I can't get somebody to help me find the thing that I'm looking for because there's a million goddamn things in the store. But look at Home Depot. The fact of the matter is it goes back to what I was saying before. It's not your store any longer, but how many other people would welcome it and see it as a value, see it as, uh, oh, they're the experts. They know what I want. They're able to take care of me. It doesn't mean that it can't be a successful business model. But I, I am of the opinion that you can do both. You can be a large store that presents in a very professional mainstream way and still have helpful, knowledgeable, good employees. And that's where I'm banking on. If an equity firm wanted to come by and buy me up, oh, heck yeah, the price tag's out there. I'll be happy to talk to you. But assuming that's not going to happen, well, yeah, but I don't want to shut down. So will I go out and buy some additional stores? Probably. Well, I look at the possibility of vertical inst- integration into Internet, possibly. But even if I don't, no, I, I don't think that I have to hang it up. I still think the business model will function. I still think there are people out there that appreciate a store, as you said, is not the Walmart of gaming stores. It's the local friendly neighborhood store. Do I think that they'll go back to doing lots of events? No. I think that, like it or not, most of the stores out there are going to have to recognize that the events are not providing enough money to keep the business model afloat. And that means that, reluctantly, they will have to start doing smaller store-sponsored events, but spend most of their time trying to cater to that new incoming freshman class of people that I've heard wonderful things and I want to have fun and my friend brought me down here, so show me around. There's a lot of emphasis right now on go out and support the local store, go out and help the people that are out there. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know that your local store has basically worked their ass off for you. They've put all their money on the line. They've put their life on the line. They're trying to do everything they can to make you happy. And whether they succeed or not, they deserve to at least be acknowledged. So I would encourage anybody listening to, no, support your local store. Find a reason to go out and buy something. Uh, Be pleasant to the people inside. They're the ones that are may not be with us here in the future. So at least show them the courtesy of appreciating them while they're here and try to help them in any way you can. Dave Wallace, if uh, someone wants to read your book, A Specialty Retailer's Handbook, where would they find that book? Uh, We still self-publish it. Uh, one of these days, I might just throw the silly thing up online and let anybody that wants to have it. What you should do is convert it to a PDF and let people buy it for, you know, name your price. We'll probably end up giving it away, quite honestly. Go to Drive Through RPG and just post it there as a zero dollar for a PDF. And, and we may. I, I still have a number of copies sitting around the office, so if anybody is interested in it, uh, just contact Kelly, my wife, at uh, Fantasy Shop Inc. I N C at Gmail dot com. Uh, we'll be happy to sell you a copy. I think it's thirty five dollars, including shipping, right now. And it's not about gaming; it's about business. So it's a series of uh, seminars that talk about cash flow, negotiations, triple net leases, naming your business, and it's full of wonderful cartoons. So for nothing else, buy it for the cartoons. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, John Kavalik art in there, right? And Jolly Black. Oh, what a delicious throwback. Yeah. So good. So, so good. Well, Dave, thank you so much. I, if, if I can only say that if you're listening to this right now and you have an FLGS you are fond of or even not so fond of, I would go so far as to say that it is likely to some degree that FLGS exists because of Dave Wallace. So thank you're you. welcome. <laughs> no, you, I was saying the, the audience is welcome, but yeah, you, you too, Dave. I really appreciate it. Although I don't regret that I left, I regret how I left. There are a tremendous number of life lessons that I must give you credit for. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, Dave, thank you again. 